And this brings us to our discussion zone where, well, well, before I get there, we will also be speaking to a Ghanaian psychologist who will also be sharing uh, her experience and trying to let us understand uh, how is it like, you know, with work and life balance, you know, in, in Ghana. Of course, they've worked with a lot of clients in Ghana and, and, and they've, they've shared and they've seen a psychologist. They can actually read your mind and tell you, make recommendations on how you can actually move forward and cope with the, the situation that you're facing at, at that particular moment. I was deep in the so 217 GMT here. I will be playing the interview I had earlier with Dr. Rachel Pugh, um, who is a, she's Welsh, she's from Wales uh, in the United Kingdom. And of course, um, she is a practicing clinical psychologist right here in our base, Ghana. Let's uh, listen up. Now, mental health, unfortunately, is still surrounded by stigma worldwide. I mean, albeit to um, varying degrees. Now, there's a lot of advocacy going on to reverse that trend. But how would you assess the approach uh, to mental fitness, well-being, work-life balance, and so on in Ghana? I have noticed some really exciting and inspiring changes in the attitudes of Ghanaians towards mental health and well-being overall, right? And I guess um, there's definitely an increase in the level of consciousness and awareness of the importance of achieving a healthy work-life balance and a healthy mental health state, which has been, you know, really, really great. There's an increase in the amount of time that they're taking to, to exercise, um, attend yoga classes. And I'm hearing more and more Ghanaians, you know, saying I'm doing my meditation, which is great. So that, that full holistic balance. And I think there's um, an increasing awareness that self-care is absolutely essential. It's your responsibility to make sure that you are self-caring. But they've had to break through the attitude that self-caring is selfish. And that, I think, has been one of the challenges that they've had to overcome. Um, because if you're putting yourself first, you know, the kind of fear that a lot of people have is, oh, but that's me being selfish and what will everybody else think about me? I you know. And, you know, if I say no to you, if I state a boundary, boundaries are what are essential for being able to maintain a work-life balance and being able to protect your own well-being and make sure that your levels of stress are manageable and not going beyond a point of, of tipping point where you are in a constant state of stress and then you're angry, then you're anxious, then you're depressed. I mean, the awareness of keeping yourself in check requires boundaries. And I'm noticing that boundaries are a conversation that people are having and understanding what is a boundary? How do I state a boundary? What does it look like? Am I able to do it? Because I think there's a lot of fears underlying being able to state a boundary. It's kind of one of those things that's easier said than done. And a lot of the things that they have to overcome are if I say no to you, will you not like me? If I say no to you, will you reject me? If I say no to my boss because I don't want to work overtime, will he no longer promote me? Will he no longer um, value my work? Will he, you know, will I lose my, 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 my uh, recognition and my, my respect in the workplace? So there's a lot of fears that have to be overcome in order to kind of confidently state your boundaries. And I think that is, people are moving towards that, wanting to learn about boundaries. I get a lot of clients, you know, asking me, I can't, I can't say no. How do I do it? Help me say no, you know, help me protect myself. Is it selfish? Am I able to do it? So kind of encouraging people, it's your right and your responsibility to yourself. And because you can't pour from an empty cup. And so if you, they are not taking care of themselves with the appropriate boundaries, then they're not going to be able to function that effectively at work. And then when they go home, they're not going to be able to manage the demands at home either. So yes, there's a definite shift in that. And I think the other, the other awareness is I'm hearing a lot of Ghanaians using the term mindset, which is you know, oh, I'm going to work on my mindset. And mindset is, is, is so important in the achievement of mental health and that health wellness balance, because it's all about your, your thoughts, the, the power of your thoughts. Um, and they, they affect the way you feel, and then they affect the actions and the choices of behaviors that you then, um, then choose. So um, kind of shifting um, the mindset is becoming, you know, is becoming also a very popular source of conversation that people are adapting, which is great. Now, let's find out this. You have worked in other countries, right? Yes. Outside Africa and what have you. 
Mm -hmm, absolutely. What has it been like working in the mental health space in Ghana? I've actually found it incredibly exciting. Um, initially, it was very quiet. Um, when I first arrived, I, you know, I was just waiting for the calls to come. Um, and so um, predominantly, I would say that the calls were coming from my European, the, the Americans, you know, the Australians, those that were comfortable with therapy. But in the last couple of years, the last year particularly, the calls are coming from my from Ghanaians, which is fantastic, and other African countries as well. And so it's definitely there's a shift. And it's it, it's exciting and it's inspiring to see the kind of clients that are coming through and the questions that they're asking, the changes that they want to see in place. And, you know, particularly, you know, young, young women wanting to be empowered and wanting to kind of have their voice heard. You know, so I'm doing a lot of empowerment work with women. And then I'm also doing a lot of work with men who are really wanting to work on their on their on their soft skills, you know, wanting to learn empathy, wanting to know how to communicate more effectively, you know, really wanting to be, you know, a, a feminist, you know, really wanting to be um, and, you know, be more equal in their marriages. They're wanting to break out of those traditional scripts. They don't want to, um, you know, they want to be they want to be loyal. They want to be monogamous. And so it's really exciting seeing that. Well, uh, well very interesting, uh, you know, points she made right there. I mean, for starters, we started, ask, I started asking by, uh, about uh, her assessment, you know, of uh, the approach, uh, generally how she assess it. Uh, to mental fitness, well-being, work-life balance, and so on in Ghana, and very interesting points she made right there, as well as uh, talking about, uh, you know, her what what it has been like for her working in the mental space in our base, Ghana, and uh, she made uh, some very, very valid points about how, you know, uh, Ghanaians, Africans generally are very, uh, you know, eager to, to, to actually speak and, and the kind of questions that she, she gets and everything and how they are shifting. It's like an increased, uh, you know, level where people, you think, okay, people are not really paying attention to this side of their lives, but they're actually making a difference and they're increasing the mindset. People are moving away from that space and it's really, really great. Let me bring in my colleagues so we can, um, uh, we can also establish conversation right here. Let me hear, let me start with Hafiz Gunu. Hafiz. Barry. Ramadan Karim. <laughs> that's that's interesting. Anyway, we'll talk about that afterwards because I'm surprised. But <laughs> surprised as well. no, let's, that's not the case. Let's just let's just continue here. Yeah, okay. You heard Dr. Rachel speak mm. about her assessments, you know, of um, mental fitness, well-being, work-life balance in Ghana, and also went ahead to talk about um, how it has been like, uh, you know, working in in that mental health space in Ghana. What was your takeaway there? Yes, uh, interesting conversation we had there with her. Mm. But uh, uh, I just want a few pointers in there. And uh, let's start with, you know, the first part of her conversation mm -hmm. about, you know, boundaries. Exactly. Yes. Uh, it's, 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 it's one of those areas where you you enforce and people tend to think you are stuck up. You yeah. Know, you are one of those people that, you know, that have issues uh Basically, you're uptight, if mm. you want to put it. Up. But that's not the case. Mm. But when you talk about boundaries and the ability to say no, mm. okay, it's one of those symptoms of people, uh, persons you refer to as people pleasers. Mm. Yes, the inability to say no, but say yes uh, to others. Yes, mm. it's it's just one of those things. Okay, such persons usually have, uh, you know, this need. They 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 want to avoid conflict, and they also tend to worry about what people would say about, about them. them. Yes. Yeah. And so they are constantly on 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 a fishing valid uh, you know uh, fishing for validation that is from others. Yes. Right. So they have self esteem issues. Mm. So that's what you call it people pleaser. And one of those things is their inability to say uh, no. No. I yeah. can't do this or I can't do that. Mm. But then again, uh, I would have loved her to go into, you know, the reasons why some of these things come up. Mm. Uh, and but then in my readings I realized that one of the reasons some of us have this aversion to say no, even when we clearly want to say no, is the fact that one, it has to come from, it kind of normally comes from our upbringing. Okay. Yes. Our because social, our cultural setting, eh? Yes, culture is one, mm. but the upbringing is another. Okay. It's a whole thing because, I mean, when you are raised as a kid, mm. okay, as a kid, you want to go out and play and you ask daddy, he says no. 
you want a new pair of shoes, you ask mommy, she says no. Right. Okay. Consistently, when this happens, what it does is that you associate the word no with rejection or denial. Mm. So, in the end, you never associate anything positive with right. no, the word no. Mm. And that's how come a lot of people have this unhealthy relationship with the use of the term no or mm-hmm. word no. Mm-hmm. Yes. There's also the issue of uh, temperament and behaviors. Yeah. Some people are just naturally wired that way. A lot of the time, they can't even explain it. Uh, they are very sensitive people. Mm. Uh, empathic, if you like. They have this ability to feel what others What you're feel. feeling, yeah. Yes, so mm. they are... Someone is pointing at this. So yeah, don't. Good, yeah, we'll me. get, we'll get anyway, there. So, so, inherently, there are more other people wired. Mm-hmm. Okay, they think of others before more themselves. Than that, right. So, because of it, they have a hard time saying no. Right. But it's something that can be worked on mm. later on in life. Okay. And you also have the cultural bit, like you mentioned. Yeah. Where sometimes... Uh, in the society that you are you are raised, mm. you know there are certain cultural pressures that comes with putting others the needs of others before, before you. Yeah. Yes. For instance, your parents, mm-hmm. even though clearly this arranged marriage they are pushing you into, it's not something. It's you not want, something you want, but, but out of respect. Exact, exactly. Out of respect or the loyalty. Needs, mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, even religiously, they will tell you what honor honor your father. Honor and mother, thy parents. Yes. Honor thy parents. Yeah, your semi gods. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> some of these pressures comes with in yeah. the territory, and right. then you grow up with this unhealthy, uh, you know, relationship with the word no, mm. and then you tend to have problems later in life. Right. That's why she says it, it can be worked on. Mm. Then uh, she went on to talk about mindsets and the power of thoughts. Right. Yes, uh, that I wouldn't delve into so much. But the other bit of a conversation of a submission that I want to look at is uh, working in the mental space. I think you asked a very good question yeah. about what the reception is like. Mm-hmm. Especially working here in Ghana, yeah, you know, you know how we sometimes are all distant when Reserved, it comes to yeah. to issues of mental health. Mm-hmm. How we we feel is it's we hardly get into those conversations, exactly. huh? and it's not just something in 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 Africa. Okay, I read a piece about African Americans in their community where where you know seeking the seeking a psychologist is, mm-hmm. is problematic for a lot of them. It's not it's, it's not about um, the affordability. No, it, it it boils down to a lot of reasons. Okay. But she 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 and to quote her, she said, "Well, those are and she made mention about Europeans and Westerners who, yeah. who actually just basically are her, you know, call for clients." Yeah. Yes, and she talked about th- those are the com- th- those are the ones that are comfortable with therapy. Mm. So, I don't know if to say they are notoriously therapy seeking, but mm. that is what she says. Yeah. But over here, it's not something. Now she's saying that well. It looks like she was waiting for the calls, but slowly mm-hmm. our people are warming up mm-hmm. to the whole idea. But here are a few reasons why a lot mm-hmm. of people don't exactly go seeking therapies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, one, uh, talking to people or talking to another person about your personal problems uh, is seen in the light of airing one's dirty laundry. Mm-hmm. So you don't exactly want to go see someone. want to dig deep, huh? Yeah, just sit and then start talking about how you feel and blah, blah, blah. And what you did. Exactly. <laughs> yes. For a couple, they feel like, well, we are basically inviting a third party into exactly, our Exactly, so yeah. We would rather not do that. Mm. Now, others, uh, and even in the black, uh, the African American community, a lot of them also see therapy as, you know, they have this, uh, you know, this image of a psychologist as one old white one that sits there and then yeah. tries to ask you questions and basically would not have an understanding of what you're going through mm-hmm. in your realities mm-hmm. as, mm-hmm. As, mm-hmm. as an African American. Yeah. 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 So they just definitely yeah. won't go mm. to see. Mm. Others also see it as a luxury endeavor. Yeah. Yes. Met, meant for the elites, eh? Exactly. It's a mm. white people thing. So <laughs> they just won't go. Right. <laughs> but that's not the case. Go. Exactly. That's and lastly, case. we have mm. uh, the issue of insurance. Uh-huh. A lot of them this, uh, especially when it comes to mental health, is not exactly covered. So right. Go. Okay. Thank you, Hafiz, uh, for your uh, early submission. Let me hit, let me get straight to my colleagues and pick their own thoughts real quick, so we can proceed. Uh, as we also talked about some of the common mental health issues, uh, clients have approached her with, as well as uh, uh, the trends she has noticed. Um, and the work-life balance here in our base gone. And then we, we wrapped it up with COVID-19 matter. But then let me go to Epi. Epi. Very. Uh, Dr. Rachel spoke a lot. Yes, yeah, she did. For actually, the first part, yes. Actually, two points. So she mentioned meditation. Now, mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. I I got introduced to meditation like three years ago. Okay. Yeah, I, I chanced up. Initially, I seen it and read about it and, you know, met people who entered it. I just thought, what is this thing? Mm. Come and sit and dream. Mm. You know, we associate meditation to this, like a monk kind of a thing. Yeah. Cross your legs, then you do. Mm. So 
We find it well, weird. The, 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 the Buddhists? He said. Oh, no, it's not all about the hum. There are different types of meditation. Yeah, the Buddhists I mean, are the one doing that the most. We yes. have Buddhas. We have different forms okay. of religion. Mm-hmm. Hare Krishna, and the rest. Ah, they all do those right, kind of things. Right. Yes. Okay. So meditation is actually you had to understand what it is. Mm. For me, when I actually uh, embarked on it, it was like for me first I thought it was five minutes. So it was a five minutes in a day, in the morning or in the evening, okay. where I would just clear my head of everything. I actually started with an app. And it just taught me to focus on my breathing. Okay. For that five minutes, don't think of anything. Just focus on your breathing, on your breath. And that was the most important thing. Now, in the process of focusing on your breath, you realize that it brings some kind of calm and peace to you. Right. So from then, it became easier that, okay, in the moment of panic, just try and meditate. And when you actually bring that calm, before you, when you come back, you're able to organize yourself and work. It works differently for different people. Mm-hmm. So from five, you increase the time and everything. Okay. But it's have a time for your mental space. There are times you're thinking about too many things. I think a lot. So sometimes you're thinking about too many things. You freeze. You don't know which one you're actually yeah, doing. Yeah, and then you're trying to, plate. that kind of a thing. So it helped. Okay. And it's something people look at and you mention meditation, someone gives you that kind of eye. Like, yeah. sister, meditation. You're weird. Ha- yeah. Oh, yeah no. Until they get to understand. Mm. Now, she also spoke about self-care. Taking care of your skill. self is, uh, is underrated in a way or mm. not really mentioned that so much. You're not selfish. You know, you're I actually have had yourself. people, not just, not even the self, I'll get the selfish part, but taking care of yourself. Someone sees you, you have time, like, hey, you know, you have time, oh. Yeah, and then there was a for time, these things, huh? Yes, and there was a I time know. I would run away from such comments. You know, people would make them feel like, hey, oh, nah, me, me, what am I doing? Yeah. You know, but then I go to a realize that my body breaks down. Mm. I end up in hospitals for various reasons. And these people that are, you have time, don't end up in hospital for those petty or Some same of, reasons. Exactly. And I realized it was important to take care of myself. Mm. And it was important not to seek their validation for taking care of myself. Right. So when someone says you have to have some of these things, uh-huh. you literally try to just tell them it's not your business. It's not your business. Or you let them know that it's important to, to you. you. Now, the uh, last point, because I know we have to rush. Mm-hmm. The last thing I took part was uh, saying no. Mm-hmm. I do have a problem with that sometimes. Okay. You know, sometimes you want to say no to somebody for something. Mm. But then I think a lot. So I'm wondering, how would they take it? Mm. What if they decide to do the same thing to me? How would you feel? How would I feel? Right. Would I want that? That kind of a thing. But I feel we should be in a space where we should know that I'm saying no. Not because I don't like you. Or not because I hate you. Or because I mean bad for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but because I don't want to. Now, if I actually do indulge you, Mm. I'll feel bad about it. Right. So why not be honest about it? And in a way, just forget what the person will think about. Right. Who you are, the person should know who you are. So the day you say no, they Mm. should actually understand it and not use the no to treat you like you saying no to your boss. You don't want to do overtime because of that. They don't pay you on time, or because of that, yeah, because that they just see you as some normal worker because you don't want to do the work. Don't get any incentive. That kind of a thing. So I think we we should get to a place where when people say no, yeah. We should respect it mm. and then not their no change how we treat them or relate to them. Okay, thank you, Happy. Let's uh, head on to the camp of Mamey so she can also say no, Barry. I will give you my Indomie noodles. <laughs> 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 but yeah. That's what you're thinking about? No, that's not what Indomie I'm thinking about. Noodles. Can we skip to the part where we talk? <laughs> okay. Right. Um, Epi talked about self care mm. and saying no, and Hafiz mentioned saying no as well. Mm. And those are some of the pointers I picked up as right, well. I mean, right, but right. they have touched on those. Mm. Sometimes it's hard to say no to people because you don't want them to to think bad about you. Yeah, I mean, maybe you're my friend. You mm. ask me for something, say no to you would. I don't know. It's like you ask me for money. Mm. I don't have a lot. But because you ask for it, and because I'm trying to think, what if I was in this person's shoes? Okay. Then that's my last money, but I have to give it to you. Because what if I was in the same situation and you said no to me? So sometimes saying no is hard because you don't want the people to see you in a, in a bad light. Have you ever said no? Maybe you're, you're depending, relying on that last change of yours and someone asked you and it's like... No. no, it didn't come with. Uh, I, it didn't come. It wasn't about money. Okay. It was about hanging out, and I didn't feel like you it. You said no. So I didn't say no initially. Mm-hmm. I just kept saying, "Oh, let's Beating up. let's wait till the weekend. Yeah. Let's wait till the weekend." Mm. And then the weekend came. It was like Friday, and yeah. then they were like, mm. 
yo, are we going out tomorrow? And they, I'm like... They didn't see you building the invincible, no. And I'm like... A concrete, truth, no. And I'm like, truth be told, I, I really do not feel up to this. Right. And I mean, you know, friends will get angry, but it was what was good for me at that point in time. Right. But sometimes saying no helps. It's, it will be hard to say you no know, sometimes. But it helps. But it helps. A lot. And then I also picked up how she's talking about managing levels of stress. Mm. Sometimes you're so stressed out, but you, there's, there's a deadline you have to meet. Mm -hmm. So you end up, even though I'm stressed, I have to, to do this. Meet it, yeah. I, I don't think it's a good thing. Mm. Sometimes you have to do it because you have to meet a deadline. But other times you just have to take a break mm -hmm. and then sit down, relax. Mm. Allow yourself a breather. Give, Give yourself, yourself a breather. Because under stress, I don't think you can again. work. Because eh? you stress yourself, you stress yourself. Before you know it, it becomes a big thing. You're broken down, unfortunately. All right, thank you very much. Let's continue. Uh, well, the rest of the interview we had, well, I had with her. And she goes a long way to talk about some of the common mental issues clients, you know, approach her with, as well as uh, the trend uh, in work-life balance. Or if there's a lack of it, she actually delved into that right here. Uh, let's continue. Now, as a clinical psychologist, mm. I mean, people do come to you, clients do come to you on a daily basis for uh, consultations or based on referrals. Yes. So what are some of the mental health issues that clients have approached you with? I think the common symptoms of referral are depression and kind of battling with low self-worth, low self-esteem, kind of feeling stuck and helpless. Also, anxiety and trauma. Sometimes it's, you know, it's manifesting as a post-traumatic stress disorder coming from either a recent adult-based trauma or even a childhood-based trauma. And then a lot of stress and feeling overwhelmed. So those are the predominant symptoms, as well as kind of relationship questions, you know, marital issues and parenting issues. And if I'm looking at the common themes underlying all of these symptoms, what I've noticed is it is the presence of self-limiting beliefs about not being good enough. That is what is underlying most kind of emotional struggles. I am not good enough. And basically there's a sense that I am only good enough when I am perfect or when I am fulfilling external validation. So I'm getting approval by my bosses or I'm being recognized as successful or I'm pleasing everybody and they're, they're, they're enjoying the, the, the care that I'm giving them. So there's this kind of unconditional sort of conditional self-acceptance. So not an unconditional self-acceptance. So that is what we have to break free from it's kind of understanding the origin of those beliefs and kind of helping them break free from the chains of the past so that they can claim their authentic selves which is this is me take it or leave it if you like me great if you don't well you know that's it I am enough just the way I am you know that is the predominant work that I do with all of my clients whatever the symptoms are because that is the, usually the cause underlying those symptoms so I am not good enough Changing that to I am enough, just the way I am. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we're talking about issues of lack of self-confidence, correct? Yes, yes. Lack of self-confidence coming from the fact that you feel you're only good enough if you are achieving sort of certain conditions in the outside world. So you're you're always your power is always out there in the other in the, in the hands of the other people. You know, they're not making a home within themselves, which is I am enough just for who I am. I don't have to please anybody, keep anything to be good enough. I'm enough, you know, and. Right. Um, Amazing. Uh, so uh, you've lived and worked in Ghana clearly for several years. Mm -hmm. um, there are nuances depending on the work sector, social, economic background and what have you. Mm -hmm. now, what do you notice to in work-life balance or is there a lack of it no there's definitely a shift i think the shift is definitely being more noted in um i guess the middle upper class those that are are working because i think that the, the Ghanaians, i think are in working are incredibly hard working and I right. think, you know, there is this, you know, there is a lot of pressure on them to kind of meet a lot of demand. So there's, I think there is a tendency to overwork and expect a lot, therefore kind of drain themselves to a point of depletion. Um, and I think, I think uh, I, those that obviously have kind of a, more of an income are more able 
to kind of step into putting up those boundaries and those self-care things. It almost feels like they're more able to certain things. Mm. Um, so there's a shift in, in that, yes, we, but we need to get that attitude um, across the board because um, but I think it's emerging now in the middle and upper class um, because they're, I guess, able to, at this point, achieve that mm. uh, work-life balance or feel more to put the things in place to enable them to sort of have help, have support, say no, delegate tasks and things. Right, now on to my final question is, uh, is about COVID-19 and how it has actually forced us to adapt new methods um, in interacting with one another and of attending to clients. Uh, regarding how confidential, sensitive some of these interactions with your client, uh, do your sessions online, virtual, how have they welcomed this idea? No, as soon as as soon as the country went into lockdown last March, I went online. Um, so, and actually, it's been incredibly popular with the Ghanaians, which is which. Me, in fact, there's a little bit of anticipatory anxiety. Oh, virtual, what's that going to be like? But as soon as they start, they actually kind of enjoy they enjoy the experience because of the convenience. There's no travel time. There's confidentiality is you know maintained, and also there's an intimacy over the over the kind of online, which I'm able to hold. I've been doing online for quite some time, skilled in kind of holding emotion, emotions online. Um, I guess that makes them feel very safe, and it's it's convenient. Yes, it's surprising how popular it is, and a lot of people have said even if you were to open up face to face, I would choose to stay online. I love Africa Global Radio. Okay, and that's another. Interesting bits right there by Dr. Rachel Pugh, a clinical psychologist. I mean, we're talking about work-life balance right here. And uh, I mean, coming from one who's European, you know, working in Ghana, practicing and, you know, engaging with um, Ghani and other people from other parts, sharing her experience. How interesting uh, the whole thing turned out to be and how are really getting inclined and aware about this whole situation, being more open, uh, as, as, as just as half has mentioned earlier. It's sometimes based on, you know, your upbringing, your cultural practice and everything makes you a bit, you know, closed. You, you, you don't open up. But then it has actually changed and very interesting. Engage my colleagues right here. So also uh, hear what they have to say but but let me just put it on record that we will also be speaking to a Ghanaian psychologist who will also be telling us about the, the work-life balance from in perspective as well. Half is Mary. Mm. No, no, it's her. It's, it's, it's a scream. So, <laughs> but but uh, even before that uh, recently, mm. uh, you are even aware of the story. I think I I a friend reached out and ah uh, yeah. Not more like a friend but an acquaintance really. You had to play around the bush. Yeah, she talked about how you know Asked that she talked about how she was struggling with something, yeah. And I was like, I Is there anything I can do to help? Now, in my mind, that was an empty gesture, mm. you know. Just to me, I was thinking, Well, it's like when you're about to eat, and someone's like, Hey, man, let's come and let's eat. Something when you, like when that. you clearly know <laughs> that the food would not be sufficient for I you. I wasn't expecting her to take me up on my offer, mm. but she did say, Okay, well, can here's you, my problem. Can you help? Can me you help this out? And that's, then I realized, nah, I had, it, to, I had to say no. You need a plan B. <laughs> <laughs> I had to come up with all kinds of mm. uh, ways to say no, but that's just by the way. And also, uh, but in the last part of her submission, she talked about depression, mm -hmm. uh, anxiety, mm -hmm. trauma, yeah. some of the cases yeah. that mm. she, she works on. Mm. And particularly with depression, uh, you just mentioned how... Yeah, uh, A.K.A.'s you know, girlfriend, yeah. Uh? A.K.A.'s girlfriend, uh, you know, lost the battle to this mm. depression. But you see, the thing about it, Depression comes in all kinds of ways, ways and, and yeah, it, it's yeah. one of those things I fear because look, a lot of the time you don't even know how you're feeling. So how then do you tell someone you're feeling a certain type of way? You don't even know how, what exactly you're going through. So it, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. It's very because I mean, at least when it's malaria, you have a headache or whatever. you have a, you, you have some symptoms. symptoms exactly, right? you definitely know where what to do. But, <laughs> but with depression, it's you look completely well. Exactly, especially even when you are in a society where they will tell you, oh. You probably are just feeling a bit under the weather. Mm -hmm. will, just I mean, go get some sleep will, or something. Yes, I mean, you, it, it's just a phase. It, it would go away. Mm. But here you are stuck in it and you still don't understand what exactly is going on. So, yes, uh, so it, it's one of those parts or depression is one of those areas that, uh, you know, when I see conversations around it, it interests me a lot. And the last part of it, 
submission as well. She talked about positive self talk. Mm-hmm. Yes, how we some it's all about you know being content and admitting, and understanding, mm. and being happy with yeah. yourself. Yeah, yeah. I remember on World Happiness Day on this same platform, we talked about being happy, and I mentioned spe- uh, the concept of destination addiction. Right. Yes. Uh, yes, and I think you were not here. Mm. Yeah, I wasn't around. I wasn't around. Yeah, continue. Yes, mm-hmm. and uh, largely it's 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 the concept or the thinking that happiness rests in something. Someone, okay. Yes, someone or something. Something, so right? Maybe you're thinking that uh, I'll only be happy when I get this raise, mm. when I get promoted to this yeah. level, at the, and until that happens. And you get that, and you realize that's not the case. That's not it. So mm. it's all about you being happy where you are, and okay. you know, constantly trying to, you know, engage in positive self-talk. Right, okay, thank you, Hafiz. Let me pick from Epi and then uh, to Mami so we can wrap it up. But just to note, we actually don't have much time, but we would definitely um, get uh, another, which is the part two of the whole, you know, psychologist conversation right here. Hopefully tomorrow we will be uh, bringing you that as well on the Africa Daily Show. Epi. Barry, yeah, mm. she spoke about self-confidence, and I think there's something a lot of people struggle with. Right. You know, in the pit, in the, that tiny, that tiniest part of an individual, mm. not getting someone to validate a certain idea already starts, this is my idea, so is it good enough? Would it sell? Would yeah. It, am I good enough? These are questions we ask. So some people, out of the lack of self-confidence, they behave arrogantly and mm-hmm. try to flaunt themselves everywhere. Now, it's not that they actually are confident, but then they are doing it so that nobody is able to get or see the insecurities they, within the exact right. And I feel we, we have to come to a place where we're actually, like she was saying, I, I call them affirmations. Okay. You tell yourself you're enough. You're good. You, you have, the thing is, if you don't believe in yourself, how do you expect someone to believe in you? Mm. You have to start. We have to start believing in ourselves. Love yourself. Huh? Exactly. Mm. And I think there's something we could actually also do. You know, when you have a wonderful and bright idea, mm. and then the first thing's like, oh, let me call this person and ask them what they think about it. Yeah. I think we could start by, let me ask me, what do I think about that idea. it? Exactly. What mm. do I think about it? And half of the time, we don't sit with ourselves to think through things. Right. We usually think about something, then we bring a third party. So we go with it as if we're okay, but we're actually rolling on what the third party or the other person said. Right. But we don't sit with ourselves to say, why do I want this? Why do I want to do this? Or why don't I want this? Mm. And have answers for ourselves. So I think we should learn to love ourselves for who we are, okay. what we are, yeah. and then we can be able to move from there. And little by little, we can build our confidence. Great one there. Uh, from Epi. Mommy? Yeah. We don't have a lot of time. Mm. I'll just talk about how she talked about some of the conditions some people come to her with is stress. Yeah. I mean, we're in a day and age where we will act like we are tired when actually what we are is stress. Mm. We tend to say, oh, I'm tired. I just I just need a little rest. Yeah. And then you rest and then you go back to it and you realize you're still having migraines. You still can't concentrate on your work. I think we can really differentiate between stress and tiredness. Tiredness sometimes. is just it's just like being tired. But stress is you're overwhelmed. You're thinking about money. You're thinking about marriage. A whole lot of you're thinking in about your mind. so many things. Like I need to finish this. I need to do this. Yeah. I need to be married by the time I'm right. by the age I'm by the age of twenty seven. Future plans and I all. need to do that. Mm. So we have to identify mm-hmm. the thin line between tiredness and, and then stress right. and then deal with it. Mm. Okay. Uh, interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, that's up. all. That's all you have. And then the, mm. there's the the whole PTSD thing. You know, we right now yeah. people talk about PTSD as a joke. As, yeah. It's a serious issue. But huh? it's a serious issue. Mm. I don't know if I told you guys about when we were we were robbed at match point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, after that thing Still happened. Still stuck on you, huh? Like right now I'm okay. Are you are you? Maybe not a hundred percent. Good. But after that happened you, you good you submitted <laughs> that because I just wanted to be sure. You just don't after say. that happened, right? Mm. Anytime any anybody made a sharp movement around me mm-hmm. you get that fright, huh? I, my heart starts to beat and I start to sweat and it's like something is happening to me. Mm. So sometimes we feel like, oh, what happened? I'll get over it. But you actually do not. Yeah. And then I like the part where she's talking about how Ghanaians are warming up to Very go and see working. psychologists. Very hard working, yeah. Mm-hmm. About, well, we're warming up to the idea of talking to someone else about yeah. our problems. Mm. I think that's a good thing. It is. Because growing up, we are, we are taught 
indirectly yeah. we we'll talk about our feelings mm-hmm. but if we're buying into the idea it's a Absolutely. good thing because mental health is, 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 a, is, a, is a huge is a big thing issue. it's a huge thing all right thank you mommy the show is africa daily on africa global radio